Charlene Kvetz, Director of Secondary School Advising here at Carroll. And I am joined in the back by my two colleagues, Cece McNally and Francie Fenton, who are the backbone of this department, honestly. And we are so happy and thrilled and appreciative to have Florence Academy presenting in person. This has been four years plus since we have had a school presenting to families in person. So thank you very much. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> and I would like to introduce Michael Zanetti, who is the, now let me see if I get this right, normally like the Director of Admission. No, he's the Dean of Enrollment and Admission. And any other titles that you want to add on there? <laughs> okay, and um, just want to make sure there weren't any added. And then we have Jen McAleer, who is the Assistant Dean of Academics and Director of Learning Support at Lawrence Academy, and also our former math department head here at Carroll. So uh, in terms of both their incredible knowledge about who Carroll students are, who your, your children are, there is a, a, a deeper knowledge of expertise within this room. So I am going to leave it to the people you came to see, just watch myself, and um, we're going to have about a half hour presentation, if I'm correct. We're going to open it up for questions. Don't be shy. This is for you, and um, thank you all for taking time out of your day to be here. So. I just want to respect everybody's time. When's the hard stop? For, for the event? For the event, yeah. The idea was 9.30ish, but I'm guessing, you know, half hour or so presentation, half hour of question and answer, but there might be an, a little opportunity to mingle around afterwards. Perfect. We do use this space, and they, I did get a call saying, when are you going to be out? So <laughs> I'm trying to stretch it a little for you all, so we'll just we'll let it go organically and see how it goes. Is that good? Sure, yeah. All right, thank you. So I've been in, I've done a lot of these, and what I'll say is if you have a question, ask the question. Don't feel like you need to wait. I've been in some uh, presentations that want to make it a discussion, and those haven't gone well. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll present the information to you all for a half hour. In that half hour, if you have questions, raise your hand. Uh, we're happy to engage those questions and, and kind of track along the presentation. Charlene mentioned my name is Mike Paul Snetti. I'm the Dean of Admissions and Enrollment at Lawrence. I'm in year three. Prior to Lawrence, I worked at another independent school for seven years in Connecticut. I also have a higher ed background at Brandeis University and Northeastern. Uh, so uh, was a little bit persistent on coming in person. I love to, I haven't been to Carroll yet, so trying to find the building got me a little bit behind. Uh, navigating the timeline on traffic, I was recommended to leave an hour early. 30 minutes early. I am always late anyway, so um, thanks for bearing with me. But anyways, extensive background in admissions, and a question I often get in the interview process is why, because I'm newer, a lot of the LA faculty, and Jen's newer too, but minus us too, a lot of the LA faculty are like 15 to 20 years, 15 to 30 years. So the question I often get from children is why did I choose Lawrence? And I, it's one of my favorite questions. Um, and you all can feed that to your uh, kids. <laughs> um, so ultimately, why did I choose it? The, the thing that I tell families is I did have options, just like y'all are gonna have, hopefully, have good options. And I was able to see what school worked well for me. I came from a school that was coat and tie and very rigid. I didn't want that. I'm from Lynn, Massachusetts, and that uh, is just not how I was brought up. I went to a place like that. I worked at a place like that. I didn't have um, an inclination to be to continue on in a place like that. And Lawrence, while it has a history of tradition, doesn't have that rigidness. It's a very comfortable school. Warm and welcoming is our tagline. Um, so that's one. And then two, I was pumped about being at a school with neurodiversity. I was really excited to have a large scope of learners. Um, I've been at schools where you could see the, the pressure on the quad from you know, getting good grades, a lot of homework each night. So you could feel that intensity. Um, at Lawrence, you don't feel that intensity. There's a community field to encourage your classmates, um, to have a learning coach, to reach out to teachers. And that's really important in high school. So 
those are my two reasons. Um, I'll let Jen introduce herself, and you can give your reason or not. I won't put any pressure on you. Okay. <laughs> Um, so Jen McLear, I was a former math department chair here for about um, 15 years. I worked here. Um, I'm now the director of learning support and the assistant dean of academic affairs at Lawrence. Um, I went to Colby, uh, and then I went to Lesley University. I found myself here at Carroll. I stayed for a while. I found myself wanting to work with teenagers older than middle school. Um, middle school, as you probably know as parents, can be a lot. Um, and so I was looking for just a little bit older. I am actually an alum of Lawrence Academy. I graduated in 03, so I kind of found my way home. A lot of our faculty are actually also alum, and some of my former teachers are actually still at Lawrence. It's, it's actually a nice <laughs> way. So, um, but I found myself for the same reasons that I found myself at Carroll, I wanted to move to Lawrence. I wanted to work with an older population, but they really accept the neurodiversity. They understand our children. They understand the strengths that they bring, as well as everybody needs just a little bit more support. So that's where Great. I found myself. Uh, so the, there's some slides that are going to be 10,000 feet, and then we're going to work our way uh, down into, I think, what the room's kind of interested in. Uh, so if you want to go the first slide, Jen. Uh, we always like to start with our mission. It's an original piece from 1792. So it has stood the test of time, which is really important. Our head of school, Mr. Shivey, who's in year 14 now, uh, always tells me to address the room and start with this because it's so important to us. Uh, we just did a little tweaking of the mission, just some wordplay. Uh, but it's still consistent with the original. So Lawrence Academy recognizes you for who you are, inspires you to take responsibility for who you want to become, and empowers you to take action for the greater good. Um, our students know it, our faculty know it, and our first introduction to families is the mission because it just is a piece of us and uh, rings true from 1792 to today. Uh, this is like when I do a presentation internationally. <laughs> I say, this is America, <laughs> this is New England, and then we're over here. You all kind of have a good idea of where we're looking, so we'll just keep moving on. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with like Groton and our campus, I'm sure most of you are, but there may be some who are not, uh, we're right on Main Street, which is really important for uh, high school students. I went to a boarding school that was isolated in rural Connecticut and just the walls of the campus. We have the luxury of beautiful campus on Main Street. This is Groton Hill Music Center, it's been renamed. This is a mile away, it's a $350 million music complex. If you have not seen it, I will personally show it to you if you come to campus uh, because it's that, it's that stunning. Cafes, Groton Inn, Gibbet Hill. So there's life, there's civilization. What I tell students is um, the sidewalks on Main Street, this is true, are also considered campus. So if you have a free period, uh, if you want to go grab a slice of pizza with your friends, you do have a little independence in a really safe small town. So the setting of the campus is a is an important piece to kind of think about as you're working through different schools. And we couldn't have a better location than Sheridan's Country Club. <laughs> uh, next slide, Jen. Just some fast facts. Uh, let's give you an overview about what we do at school. Uh, so, you know, when you're checking out independent schools, expectations, strong academics, great art programs, strong athletics, like those are, should just be things you expect. And this is kind of going to kind of hit upon those. So three uh, theater productions per year. We get a lot of credit for having a strong athletic program. Uh, we're in the NSL, but I would argue and say our art department could be stronger. It's a hidden gem. Um, we do a great job, and then the fact that we partnered with Brown Hill Music Center really does enhance that. Our enrollment's 415. It's 50/50 day boarding. Uh, the classes are about 12. Are you going to have bigger classes? Yes. Are you going to have smaller classes? Yes. But the right size is 12. We have international students. Right now the population is at about 10%. They're from all over the world, so you'll be in classes with students from 
Asia, Africa, South America, uh, Europe, we have Canadian students, so that uh, cultural diversity plays a role in 2LA. Student faculty is 5 to 1, 1793, we're in the NSL, we have clubs, uh, I have an advisory group, it's mandatory in my advisory to be in a club, uh, but I, not all advisors put that same pressure on students. Mm -hmm. Course offerings, all the way to advanced, when we get into like our learning coaching and um, child neurodiversity, we have former Carroll students who are, who are in advanced courses. So like the stretch of what you can do with learning coaching uh, is really impactful and I think what we'll talk about is like growth potential for students. Uh, 95, oh, sorry, that's good. <laughs> Uh, just run through the last, I know by heart, 93% uh, matriculist, we're the Spartans, and that's all you need to know. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this is the most important slide for me, other than some of the stuff Jen's going to talk about. So this is a day at LA, our academic schedule. If you come to campus and have a really good visit, and you feel like LA is the spot, the next thing I'll say is, study this because this is the day-to-day -day. if a student looks at an academic schedule at a school and it feels right like that's 98% of it because then they can understand the pace and pattern of what we're asking they can maneuver through the day and be successful uh, just a quick overview whether you're a boarding or day student breakfast lunch and dinner will be available on campus we just switched to a new food service offering has been, you know, uh, I don't know if there are any current LA families in the room. Um, so yeah, if you have a student older than a freshman, I hope you got really good news coming home for about food. That was a, it was a great switch for us. Uh, and then we have four blocks per day. One, two, three, four. Wednesdays are short. They end at about 1.15, no class Saturdays, afternoon activities for all students, study hall, some highlights. We'll just, I'll just talk about the red week and then I'll tell you the differences after. So some highlights for me, and then I'll let you comment on any highlights for them. This is unique, advisory, after first period every day. Um, I think it's really important, especially for this group, uh, for, for Carroll students too. You think about it, every day after first period, you get a pause. You can check in with your advisor, get your, get your footing, plan for the day, ask questions. If you have a difficult first period, you can talk to an adult about it. And those are small groups, about six to eight um, students per advisor. Monday is an all-school assembly with your advisor. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are small groups in your in an advisor's office. So my students come to me, we have an agenda, and then I ask if they have any questions. Friday is the student-run assembly. Second period, lunch, another pause. You can see like a pause after every class. Third period, office hours, and then fourth period. So office hours are just like they would be at a university setting where the whole school is free. You can meet with your teachers. Uh, you can use free time if you need to. Uh, if you want to walk downtown, grab a slice of pizza with your friends, you can do that there as well. I tell students the most successful kids at LA use this time efficiently. Do a little homework, meet with the teacher. Um, but if you're on top of that office hours time, you can be a really, really strong student at LA. Um, and then, as you see, we're in a block setting. So if this is your math class, you get a lot of homework, you have one, two chances to meet with your teacher. Another math class, another math class. So about three times per week. And the homework per day is about 40 minutes to an hour. That's what we quote in the handbook. It often depends how efficient you are with your work. So. If you, our, te our, our teachers are designed to give you work that lasts 40, to, 40 minutes to an hour. If you're a student who just takes longer to do your homework, you're gonna have more homework 
by an hour, but the time ones can be the same. Um, and then the differences between the two weeks are just how the classes rotate, um, so they'll move. And then, as you see here, Monday afternoon, we have clubs and omnibus. Omnibus is like a scheduled advisory time of bigger programming. So we have, for example, like Martin Luther King week, we could have a special kind of uh, advisory for that in omnibus. And then, um, what else? I think I hit on all the pieces I want to hit on. Then I'll make one more comment before I let Jim uh, add anything I missed. Uh, when I show this to students, you can I can see like 99% of the time their confidence just take over. I wish I had this schedule in high school. Um, it gives the opportunity for students to learn, not just do well on exams. Um, so the feedback from our population is that it is a comforting um, schedule, they can move through the day efficiently and be successful. Um, so I don't know if you want to add anything on this slide. So the classes are 75 minutes. It's a little longer than what a lot of kids are used to in middle school. But the nice part is you have a break between every class. Um, every kid who's in learning coaching, I don't think I've I'm pretty redundant with saying it, you need to use office hours. Even if you're feeling confident, just get in there and make face with the teacher. Use that time. Um, study hall, that's for boarders. So unless you have some sort of restricted status where you need to come in, they never make day students come in for that. Okay, so that time is not like your kids are there. Uh, so I'll make that clear. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then the last thing I'll add, day students have every opportunity boarding students have, minus sleeping over. And I, I live in Elm Tree dorm and I've already had a few day students sleep over who like lost power on the weekend and at home. So it's that type of place where if you lose power you can stay in the dorm. I got pillows and legs. <laughs> Sorry, I just have two questions. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, 45 minutes to an hour of homework per class or each evening? Each evening. Each evening in total. It's total goal. Is, is in the handbook. Right, in the handbook, got it. And then, um, just back to the study hall, if there was a day student that needed to stay late or wanted to take advantage of study hall, is it an option or no? That late in the evening or not usually, usually they try and get the day students off campus. Like um, after dinner, if they stay for dinner? Can, yeah, they so stay for dinner? our library is open. Okay. They want the day students to leave by around, I think, 8.39. Sometimes, the, our library is open for okay. you to study yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there's a adult on duty in the library. Um, you can, we'd like student, day students to get off campus by like 9.30, mm -hmm. but if you come to dinner, the library is open to work if you got a late pickup. Yeah. Typically, if, if there's a you know situation where a family just has a later pickup because of job requirements, just communicate that with Student Life Office and we'll, we'll figure out a way to handle it. Yeah, no, that's helpful, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No. no. How do those two schedules, are they like, are they like alternating weeks, or is one yeah. student on one schedule, one student, like, how does that, how do these work? Alternating yeah. weeks. They're alternating weeks, okay. Sometimes it won't be every other week, depending on, so we had a holiday, Jewish holiday, where we had to flip a Wednesday, Friday, and then we had Mountain Day that got postponed, but we ended up having two red weeks in a row. Um, we try and look at all the schedules to make sure that all the blocks have an equal opportunity in a trimester, so that's the academics office job. Thank you. And then one other follow-up question to the homework. So do these um, teachers work in a team so they kind of know, I have another student that so it's supposed to be like an hour of homework, but there's not a lot of coordination between the teachers. So there's some nights that they have, he has tons, and other nights he has none. And it's like, okay, as a report, it's like they work in a team environment and so they kind of know who's giving what on what night. More departmental, I would departmental. say. And then you would work with the advisor, and if you had a learning coach, work with them, and then it comes to the academic office, and then Christine Turgeon and I will deal with that okay. to kind of manage. Okay. Yeah, the faculty knows the philosophy. Are there going to be situations where uh, students get more or less than that number? Like, of course. Yeah. Can't avoid that. That's when the student has the advisor, the learning coach, to say, like, I got, this is what's in front of me, and then they have the adult advocates to work through those situations internally. Um, I, I saw one more hand. I just had a quick question. Um, I saw blocks A through F for freshmen. What are those classes typically like? 
A through J. A through G. <laughs> Sorry, A through G. Yeah. It depends. Um, so more often than not, you're going to have your English humanities class. You're going to have the social studies history class, mm -hmm. math, science, which is typically physics as a freshman. Um, and then you have an arts requirement that you need to have. And then you do have a language requirement, but some kids have waivers. Um, and that's a personal choice as to whether or not you use the waiver to do pass-fail, or if you choose to just excuse languages, which could limit some college options. Um, but you do have a free period. If you have a learning coach, two of those blocks or one of those blocks a week are taken up halfway. So it's a 75 minute block, you have a 35 minute period with your learning coach once or twice a week. Okay. Because they lose some free block, but it's not really. Just to piggyback on that shit, we have placement tests on the way in to make sure we get students in the right courses. Okay. And then there's an ad drop period the first two weeks of school to continue, like to make sure we have kids in the right classes. That language coach half block scenario that you just pointed out, what percentage of kids take advantage of that? Learning coaching? Um, about 15 to 25 percent, I'd say. Yeah, right now we're at, I'd say, Matt, we're at the top end of that, about 25 percent. Yeah. A follow-up question on the learning coach, so is that like a faculty member? We have, yeah. a, we have a few slides, that, I got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> we will get there, that's, that's me. <laughs> Another hand. I'm yeah. just going to do one more follow up on the yeah. foreign language. If your child has not done foreign language, um, what kind of support is offered to, if they want to do it, to get started in high school with foreign language? So our intro level courses are pretty accessible to the students. Um, typically, a lot of parents think that Latin is a great option because we've seen <laughs> Greek and Latin roots. That's not how, we don't go about teaching it the same way that Carol would. So. I would say Spanish, French. They're trying to get me into the Mandarin now. They want the Mandarin kids. <laughs> I've been working with her. Um, but it's very introductory, and it's not the, they're not alone. I'll tell you that. All right, so this is more of a, a differentiator slide. A lot of great schools out there. What are the key programming pieces that makes Lawrence Academy different from other schools? Uh, so we're going to do a deep dive into learning coaching. I'm just going to skip over that for a moment. Um, other key programs that are really important to us that are signature uh, winter program. Uh, so that is something you're going to learn more about if you visit campus. That's a two-week experiential learning program that happens after winter season. It's available for, it's required for all students. It's a, it's a graduation requirement. Uh, I love it because it happens after winter sports season ends. So if you're in like, let's say the New England Championship for basketball and hockey, we win on Sunday, mm -hmm. on Monday, you go to your winter program. So you, all students go. Um, and it's really divided into two different phases. One's like a local in the crowd community or in Massachusetts where you're just taking day trips um, to different locations. And the other is a big travel opportunity. So what are some examples? I'll give you one local example and then one or two travel opportunities. So one local example would be working on a farm, doing like sustainability projects, commuting back and forth. Um, there's community service, there's science-based research ones as well, so there's a lot of different winter programs in the local area. Uh, if you're traveling, there's like the scale of travel gets pretty significant. Uh, this year we're going to the Galapagos for a science research project. We've done uh, wildlife photography in Montana. Um, and the one thing else I'll add is, you've probably gone on a couple winters. We're in year 50, so we're good at it. It's not like you're, you're children, the, the test children on winter. I think we've already covered that. Um, so it's a great program. It gives you that balance of all right, I was just in school in the classroom setting for half the year. Now I can get in the field, um, which is really important. And again, I worked at Northeastern in the co-op program, and that was the co-op made Northeastern, Northeastern. Um, and you know, we feel like the only other you know program that matches what Northeastern doing is Little Winter. Um, do you, do you remember which? 
Winter. I'm actually running a wind term this year that I did as a freshman at Lawrence. Um, it's the Head Start and Lowell program, so we have kids going into the Head Start program and working with the children and the teachers. Um, I then went to Utah to work in an animal sanctuary for two weeks, and we did hiking in Zion National Park. Then I did kayaking in Florida, and then uh, snorkeling at St. John. Really ramps up, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Quick yeah. question, do, do you do wind term? Is that every year? Yes. Every year. Yeah, it's a four year, four year graduation. It depends if you start as a ninth grader, it's four years, start as a tenth grader. Um, my, my daughter's school has something similar, but it's every other year, so I was just curious. Yeah. Um, run by faculty, no cell phones allowed, it's great. Uh, <laughs> and then, so the second one is the partnership with Crown Hill. If you have a musician in the family, um, I cannot into words on how special this partnership is and how beautiful this facility is. The only thing I could say is if you have a musician in the family um, who is interested in instrumental music, in instrumental music, group ensemble, chamber, you have to look at Lawrence and the partnership with Groton Hill and I'll make sure to take you over there when you come visit. Um, just stunning place. Super yeah. question about that. I was on the parent call last night and this came up and I wasn't aware of it. Um, Lucas is not in the music world, but um, I didn't know if they have voice there. So we don't offer voice through Groton Hill yet. Uh, we're in year two of our partnership. Could it be a piece down the line? Like, for sure. Uh, right now we are just starting with instrumental musicians as a baseline. And then, you know, the top end of that could be conservatory for us, but we haven't, we haven't gotten past the instrumental musician piece yet. Our voice students have the full complement of an art department at an independent school, so we still have what you'd expect on the voice side in-house, with the caveat being you can perform at Groton Hill, so our voice performers can leverage the space there, but they don't have the instruction. So it's still a, a nice piece. Any other questions? Oh, nice one. Uh, um, my daughter plays cello, and where would it fit into her schedule? Is it treated like a club, or is it? So it's, it could be treated, it, it depends on what her afternoon look like. Okay. We could treat it as a sport, so it would be like a fall sport requirement. Okay. If she's playing soccer in the fall, we could do private lessons, you could do like, fit it in on Saturday, yeah. Um, so it, it depends on if it's the only thing or it's an addition. Uh, but if it's the only thing, we would treat it as like a varsity sport. Um, and we have, we have travel back and forth. It's a mile away, uh, but in February, it's not an easy mile <laughs> with each other. <laughs> So we'll give you a ride. <laughs> traditions, I'm just going to highlight one. We have a lot of great traditions. Uh, Jen talked about Mountain Day. We had to postpone it. This year, uh, we're scheduled to go to Mountain Day, what, like a week or two ago? Yes. So, raining. It's raining. The Mountain Day is in Mount Monondoc. We're in a year of like 100 or so of climbing Mount Monondoc. And what I love about our traditions is we have a lot of them. But specifically Mountain Day, it's where the whole school goes up to Mount Monondoc. We climb it, it's like a orientation field. You're walking with different groups of kids. Um, everyone's required to go as far as they can. That's just like 10 feet up the base and back down to play fun games. That's fine too. But what I was like impressed by on my first Mountain Day trip was that we brought the dining hall with us. So it gives you like a, an idea of what Lawrence is about. The dining hall came and they, I was really taken back. They took out all their um, equipment. They started making, what did they make? Mac and cheese, tomato soup. So on the base of the mountain, the whole school goes and we have a nice meal too. So I felt like that's what encompassed Lawrence. And I love seeing it as a faculty member. Um, but I don't know if you want to add on to some traditions that you like. I, I think that was my favorite tradition. <laughs> <laughs> I also grew up on the base of Mount Monadnock, so that was like an incredibly special trip for me. But we had um, Founders Day too, 
Um, we have spoon hunt. There's spoon, like oh, a, spoon hunt is new. Yeah. I wasn't. That doesn't okay. exist. Yes, yeah, so you have a spoon with somebody's name on it. And you have to run around campus. It's uh, controlled chaos. But <laughs> the kids are really into it. The faculty all play. Yeah. So. It rained last week during spoon hunt. Last year during Spoon Hunt, and it was messy. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll give you the warning if you visit during Spoon Hunt week, like, have your head on a swivel. Oh, mm -hmm. they all come out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, and then afternoon programming is uh, really important at LA. We have uh, like a wide variety and some unique ones. We have skiing, we have um, mountain biking, the Ground Hill Music Partnerships with a lot of different afternoon programming. All right, we are, we're running slow, so we're going to keep. Uh, so we're going we're to learning coaching, so I'll let Jen take over, and this is where the time you can ask a lot of questions too. Awesome. So um, learning coaching is something that we do at Lawrence that's quite unique. Um, as our mission states, we really want to recognize, inspire, support our students, all of our students who come in. Um, we recognize neurodivergence as both a strength and something that can be harnessed within our community and appreciate it. So we do understand that everyone learns differently and one of those ways is through learning coaching and that's how we support you. So who? Currently, we have nine full-time faculty who do learning coaching, two part-time faculty, part-time meaning they may teach one English class, one is an outside psychologist as well, um, for about, I'd say this year actually, it's closer to 100 out of 400 students who are enrolled in the program. It's one-to-one -one learning support. We will go over strategies about how to access the curriculum, how to access your notes, how to access the technology. Um, the beginning of the year for a lot of ninth graders is just how do you use your Schoology page? How do you find feedback? What do you do with the feedback? How do you use your notes? With the goal to kind of titrate that out so that they can be independent. Um, the goal of learning support is to support them where they need and take away the supports as we can um, so that they're not going to need it come senior year. Um, where? Everywhere, I would say at this point. So it's in the schoolhouse. The Anson Academic <laughs> Building is the biggest hub for learning support. We also actually have a couple offices in the learning, uh, the library, excuse me. And how many times do we meet? Once or twice a week for about 35 minutes. Now, I will say, our learning coaches are incredibly supportive. We're the, your child's advocate in that moment. Um, and so if you teams me and I'm your learning coach, I'm going to make time for you, okay? So types of accommodations. So when you provide a neuropsych in, their, in your disclosure form to us, we can provide these seven accommodations for your children. Those are legally required for every teacher to follow. So the extended time, small group setting, or separate testing for assessments, Use of a calculator according to math department policy. We've recently figured out what that means. It means that if kids are not allowed a calculator, your child would be allowed a four function calculator. So not the fancy graphing calculators. No penalty for spelling errors when spell check cannot be used. Use of a computer for written expression tasks. More often than not, everything at LA is by computer, but when it's not, you're allowed one. Um, use of audiobooks, digital text, and or speech to text. And that's huge. Um, the volume of reading can be big. That one, a lot of our kids take advantage of. And then the language waiver, which is what I was talking about. And that can either exempt you from a foreign language or make pass fail. So those are our seven accommodations. With that, we also have recommendations. And so I would read through your child's neuropsych. I would create a profile saying this is how they learn. This is what best practices in the classroom happen. Recommendations are this is what could happen. Accommodations are what must happen. So all of our teachers have to read those learning profiles. And so if you're in learning support, you have a learning profile. If you have an accommodation, you have a learning profile. It gets posted to their profile online. Teachers read it. And they must understand what that means in the classroom. Office hours, as we went over, are offered three times a week as an open time, four times a week sometimes. Um, for students to meet with teachers. So if your student is having trouble in learning coaching, understanding a physics assignment, it's not my time to necessarily teach them physics. I might go through their notes and say, let's try and figure this out together. How can you use those notes? But I might turn to them at some point and say, you really need to go see your teacher. Team's your teacher. 
Any, so for learning coaching. Any questions yes. specific learning coaching, and then I can we can I think have a any other questions we missed, and then move on to next steps. Like the twenty five percent of kids take advantage. Is this additional support for the faculty to you know all the faculty here at OG training, right? Like yeah. I'm not suggesting that elsewhere, but like. Are the faculty somehow given additional training given the number of kids who take advantage of it? That's a fantastic question. Yes. So um, my role and Christine's role as the Dean of Academics and the Assistant Dean of Academics is to educate our faculty. So we have, I think you saw the schedule, there's a student sleep in on Blue Week. That means, um, and on the Red Week actually, every Thursday. Uh, that is when we have our full faculty meetings and that's when Christine and I will get up and say, these are what these numbers mean in the neuropsych. This is what a recommendation is. This is what an accommodation is. And please come to our office if you're struggling with somebody. Um, I think as much as we say support for the students is the biggest thing, I would say support for the faculty. You're never alone. And if you're finding that a kid's just not getting something, come talk to us um, and let's figure it out. Yeah, the student profiles, uh, the, uh, the learning coaching office builds for each student is essential in that teaching so our faculty our teaching faculty have um, the ability to look at those profiles and say like okay this student needs this type of differentiated learning in the classroom to be successful so they um, have the tools they need um, to teach their classes and the smaller size just enables them to do that a little bit better for the um, learning coach that, how much are they a part of the team that this the student has on the faculty, so versus like yep. an outside tutor would be driven by the child, and then you'd hope the student would say, yep. This is what I'm learning, and this is what I need. Like, how much is there communication? Great question. So, on Schoology, we have access to all the kids, um, both grades and assignments. And so before kids walks in my office for the day, I'm going to look at their Schoology page, see if there's anything missing, see if what's coming up. And then they do walk me through their day a little bit because that's where I want them to go. Yeah. Um, but the first thing you do when you walk into a learning coach's office is I'm going to talk to you about your profile. Who are you as a learner? We're going to type a message up on Teams to all of your teachers with me on it to say, this is how I learn and here are the accommodations I'm afforded. Um, that way, it puts us all in the same virtual room, if you will. And so if a teacher is struggling, they can come to that space and say, is anyone else seeing this? How long has this learning coaching program been in existence at once? It's great. It's been a, I want say like 10 or 15 yeah, years. I'm in year three yeah. and I think, I want to say about 10 plus. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's changed over yeah, I'm sure time. it's developed yeah. over yeah. 10 years. But but about 10 years, right. yeah. And then I, I'd say specifically for Carol, the luxury we have is obviously Jen and Christine came from Carol, so they know the students, they know what they need. Um, and we are, we have, you know, just by institutional knowledge from both places, a leg up, I'd say, on the competition as far as like, we know the curriculum students who learned at Carroll. We know how that rolls into Lawrence Academy. And we can position kids really well to be successful. Um, the accommodations we offer are what we're really good at like the seven accommodations, the one or two times per week. When we get outside that, that's when we get concerned about putting a student in, the, in a position to be successful. Um, so that's when you'll have a conversation with the mission officer and be like, hey, this is, I know what you offer, this is what my child offers. Um, could we take a look at the neuropsych, talk to uh, the learning coaching office to see if this is the best fit? Um, because what my job is, is to make sure that each student who rolls into Lawrence Academy is in that position to be successful. Um, and if you feel like, all right, I want to have a conversation with an admissions officer about X, Y, or Z, um, like we'll, we'll be happy to do that as well. So the uh, kids that are getting coaching are doing it during office hours? No. Yeah. So it's, they have a free block. Every kid will have at least one free block unless they take part of the language waiver or defer it to their sophomore year. Um, and part of their free block twice or once a week for half of that block they will meet. And, and so then the office other, hours are open. And so the other kids are, they have a free block there after the big one or they Most likely in the library or on their way to Duncan's, if I had to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> are they 
they getting you coffee? Or just <laughs> Some get me coffee. <laughs> But I would just add there's like Lawrence is a place where there's no stigma attached to learning coaching. I think as I would say anecdotally, some of our students who are, you know, jockeying in the advanced courses and trying to get into top institutions at the collegiate side, um, ask for learning coach as well because they know the benefits of it. So it's a place where a learning coach is seen as a positive. Any other questions? I think I got one or two more slides. Uh, so, what does the the application process look like? Uh, so, one, the first step is just inquire. Uh, go to our website, fill out an inquiry, and then two, you can schedule your visit. That's when we can provide you with a student tour guide. You can meet with someone like myself. Uh, your child will interview. Uh, and then we'll have a conversation with the parents and that's when you can ask specific questions about um, academics or your student's learning profile and we can either answer them or get you the information to answer them. On uh, that visit, it's about an hour and a half. It's easy to do. We have an online calendar. Pick a day that works for you. Even if you're unsure if you want to apply to LA, I would say visit. Um, and then you can figure out if you want to apply. Uh, our applications are due by January 15th. Sneaks up on you. <laughs> um, we require recommendations. You have one of the best uh, placement offices available to you, so they'll walk you through what we need. We're SSAT optional, and we were, the last two years we didn't even look at them uh, from students who submitted them. We really prioritize the interview. We prioritize recommendations from teachers, transcripts, um, principal recs, just a holistic approach to the application. And because of our mission, I think um, what we're most looking for is good citizens who will contribute to the community. Um, so that's really important for us as well. So you get your application in by January 15th, and then there's this like anxious waiting period where we're making our decisions but it's just part of the process. Uh, it's a natural part, and then we send out decisions on March 10th. Um, our decisions are either accept, waitlist, or regret. Um, we often accept students from the waitlist. Um, it's pretty competitive. Last year, our acceptance rate was 30% for Lawrence Academy, um, so we've increasing, increasingly become a little bit more um, uh, I would say competitive in the last few years um, when there's post COVID when there's been some some growth. And then last step is revisit and enroll. Families will have the opportunity to come back to campus, check out Lawrence, go through a revisit day, talk to current families, um, and then we require decisions on April 10th. So five easy steps, but it's probably <laughs> it's going to seem a little bit longer at home. Um, the, the biggest thing is like come and visit, see if it's the right place for you. Uh, there's no pressure, and the ball is always in your court in the process. We're kind of just reacting to what you do. If you apply, we'll give you a decision. Um, if we accept you, then you decide what you want to do with that decision. So the ball is always in your court. I'm curious if you're accepting 10th graders. Yeah, we will. Um, so the composition of the school is really balanced right now. Um, we'll probably look to have new ninth grade class at about 90 to 95. Our 10th grade class, we typically add you know, 10 to 20 students. Um, we work with Carol, we work with junior boarding schools, so we save some spots for those kiddos. And then in grade 11, we'll add to like five to 15 kids for all different reasons. Uh, might, most of those, half of those will probably be athletic re recruitment, reclass. The other half are just you know, students need a fresh start uh, junior year at a new school. Along the state lines, how, do you, how does admissions look at naturally rising eighth graders with reclassing ninth graders? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
there's no, I mean, I, I would just default to like our admission rubric where grades, recs, and um, you know, good citizens, the holistic approach. The reclass piece isn't really weighed in the admission process. It would probably be utilized if a student did not have a successful ninth grade and then were, were you know, in their recommendations it said we advise like a reclass year because um, it would be beneficial to the student to have another ninth grade class. But again, it's like a very case-by-case -case basis. Um, I'd say most families in the last two years were leaning towards a reclass because they thought their children needed it coming out of COVID. So that's kind of put a little twist on the reclass year as well. But it's, it's essentially a case-by-case -case basis. Some kids are ready for nine, some kids reclass nine, and it's good for them. It's great. Can you speak to just like logistics? Like, I think a lot of us play on the cusp of like day student, from a distance perspective, like day student first quarter. Like, is there just in your experience, like, when you get to the forty-five minute hour, like, are that just too much for that kid, or is you know, I don't know if you have any experience. Yeah, I got a lot of experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the million dollar question. Um, so I was a boarding student. I would always default to board. It's an awesome experience, independence, camaraderie, being on campus, eliminating any community is beneficial for a student. So I would always be an advocate for boarding, so just like understand that. Rose-colored, I like boarding. Um, I'd say transparently over 45 minutes is too much, especially for a younger student, you know, an hour and a half per day, plus traffic, multiply that over the course of the school year, it's difficult. And then, you know, if your student's making that commute, you may have to cross 495. So the, the ask for a kid um, when you could opt to boarding just seems like an easy decision for me. If you're under 45 minutes, I think that's ultimately the magic number. Um, where you could be successful as a day student. Not to say you couldn't be successful over 45 minutes, it would just put an additional stress on the student. Uh, we have boarding students from Groton, we have boarding students from Chapel. <laughs> um, and we're 50-50. How you apply doesn't matter to us. We have a lot of students that start as day, and then the first day of school I got five requests to be boarders. <laughs> so like you can imagine, the parents driving an hour the first day of school and they're like, do you have any spots for boarding? <laughs> I, said, I, I said, no. Because <laughs> we had this conversation in March. <laughs> um, I would but, also add that like the for ninth graders to start boarding, you all start in structured study hall, which is you go to a specific place, you turn your phone in, and you have somebody, usually learning coaches, watching them and saying, what are you doing? Do you need any help? It, it, it just gets them in that routine of, I need to get my work done. And I remember actually going to Colby and thinking, oh, it's 8 to 10 p.m., I have to be doing my homework. I just like, it's like Pavlov's dog, you know? Um, so I think that is a good advantage of boarding as well, especially with 45 minutes. That's yeah, if you're, four, if you're 45 minutes away, uh, we have a class on Saturday, so you know, accessibility to get to see students is really easy because if you think about it, if you're an hour away, you're up so early, uh, the students are gone from you know, 7 a.m., could be back at like 9 p.m., so their time home is just like sleeping hours. So just something to put totally in the conversation as well. Uh, I was curious about the acclimation of a 10th grader compared to a 9th grader. You've talked a lot about how when I you know, sort of start their mm -hmm. time at that LA. I was curious what that looks like for an 10th grader who might be thinking, how do I get fit in mm -hmm. in this school? This year we did something a little different, and um, we had class trips. Um, so the first week they had activities to do to get to know new students, but then they also went various places like Project Adventure, Boundless Adventures, and. The seniors went on a boat cruise, um, and it was just a day to spend with your classmates. And then we had kind of a Friday activity, brain game type activity where you spent all day, all evening with your grade as well. So they, they've made a conscious effort to make sure that 
you're not alone. And then I would say the afternoon activities are vastly important for that as well. Yeah, just to add on to that, so the first six days or orientation or so, um, every student has a advisor. They have a student leader that they get introduced to. Um, so it's pretty seamless. I would not, that's the one thing I would not be worried about is acclimation for a new 10 to 11th grader. I think the cherry on top would be playing a fall sport or being in a fall activity just to get um, a baseline group of, of students to interact with throughout the school day. And then you're gonna grow that um, organically, obviously through orientation classes and experiences through winter and you get a whole new group of friends you go away with for two weeks. So it's, it's 10th graders, 11th graders, they, they have pretty seamless transition. Um, but boy, how is the how is it broken down? Are the different age groups mixed into one dorm? Are they singles, doubles, squads? How does that work with students? We have a campus that was built in 1793. <laughs> <laughs> so you just opened Pandora's box. <laughs> Everything you just mentioned is uh, on the table. Yes. <laughs> uh, singles, doubles, uh, triples. Uh, the dorm I live in has like pod living. Uh, you may have air conditioning, you may not have air conditioning. Uh, if you're in a ninth grade dorm, you'll probably have a student leader who's a, a senior. Um, so every, everything is on the table, uh, but we'll have students in a comfortable set. So the dorms are broken up by grade. So there's a ninth grade, a 10th grade, 11th grade dorms, or are they mixed grades? They're mixed, but age appropriate. Okay. Talk more about the interview process. I mean, is it typical that a child is coming to the school, seeing the school for the first time, and then you're shuffling them off into an interview? And yeah. So, the, how the interview process works is uh, you come in, mm -hmm. I'll introduce, if I'm interviewing you, I'll introduce myself, and then I'll introduce you to the tour guide. Mm -hmm. The tour guide will take the family around or the student for 45 minutes and get them familiar with the school. Uh, and then when y'all return, I'll come back out and if I sense the students nervous, mm -hmm. I'll break the ice for them. And, and we have very veteran interview uh, admission officers who all are well trained at interviewing. And then we'll take the student to our offices for about 15 or so minutes. We'll have um, a baseline set of questions, but we'll all have our own style to execute those questions, and then we'll give you feedback. Sometimes students are really nervous, and that's how it goes. <laughs> Sometimes students, the parents think the student is really nervous, and they do a great job once they get away from the parent. <laughs> uh, and then the parent comes and says, how was the interview? Like, real nervous. I was like, they were great. <laughs> um, but kids, like, kids are good. They, they rise to the occasion. It isn't a job interview, it's a conversation about a school. And we do a good job of letting kids know that. And our placement office at Carroll is really good at preparing you if you would like to take advantage of that. So yeah, yeah, do that. Do, do it, they do a mock interviews. They do a mock yeah. interview. <laughs> like it's going to be, kids are going to be nervous on their first interview until they're done. But they're not as painful as they seem. I think we're scheduled to come to the arts event. Yeah. Um, like, no, I think it's November 9th. That's not an interview, right? That's just a... That's a general open house general. that if you're interested in, like we have Arts Week. Yes. So um, the program will be general open house and then you can go to an arts event on campus if you're interested after. Great, thank you. So no interview. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this Saturday is an open house too, right? This Saturday is our... Okay. Are you trying to see my kid up for interview? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, we do three smaller open houses. Um, we did the big dog and pony show, but I didn't feel like it was productive. Um, so we're doing we're trying three small ones, um, designed to be a little bit more intimate, kind of like this. Uh, you can ask questions and, and you know uh, meet some faculty and students. So this Saturday is actually closed to registration because we got. Um, our room filled, 
we have one in November, uh, October and November as well. I saw some more hands, uh, just wanna make sure we cover everything. What kind of programs do you offer in the arts category? Do you have anything specifically on your mind? Because we have a lot. Theater. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Theater programming. There's uh, also the academic side would offer, you know, types of theater classes. Um, so you have a blend of academic offerings in the art department and then afternoon programming in the art department. We have, uh, like I said, three productions. They're treated as sports, so you could do like a fall play, winter play, spring play as your athletic requirement or as your extracurricular requirement. You could also be stage crew as a requirement as well. Do you have a dance program? Yeah, excellent dance program. And same thing with theater. It can be treated as your fall, winter, and spring um, programs. Black Box Theater, it is when the, the dance recitals or the dance programming happens. It's like a cello crowd, so it's really popular. I think my question was along those lines of just can you talk a little more about these afternoon activities? Because it sounds like it's a required block. So, what are some of the choices beyond typical sports or theater or some of the obvious ones? Yeah, so uh, dance, theater, uh, Grand Music Center. So, arts are like I said, hit in the end, uh, you can't get those type of options at most schools. So that's a, a, a great piece. We have, you know, obviously a lot of sports, ISL, um, uh, commitments in athletics, some of the like not as well-known offerings. We have an outdoor program in the fall. We have mountain biking. We have community service. Um, also independent, so we have like horseback riders on campus who can do independent. Um, we have students doing independence in like a wide variety of situations. In the winter, um, we have rec skiing, downhill racing. Uh, in the spring, um, we have like mindfulness, yoga. So there's a lot of different pieces. I would say arts are covered, athlet athletics, and then like mindfulness, yoga, um, along with like outdoor programming. Something for every student. Like, I, I'm actually pretty impressed with how much we can pull off in the, in the afternoons. And then if we don't have it, we can do it independent. <laughs> uh, I don't know, did I miss anything? The only thing I was thinking of was strength and conditioning and then they have like health and wellness, which is like the mindfulness and yoga right now. So. And maybe to add that um, I'm aware you have a multitude of Kind of levels of teams so in terms of maybe wanting to try something new it's not that you necessarily have to be skilled in a certain sport or activity because you do have multiple levels of teams in a lot of areas correct yeah we would i would always advocate for even if you like for example we have a really good hockey football team but we have a lot of students who want to try hockey and football and this is the place you can do it because um, our coaches, all the way up to the varsity level, want kids at the introductory level, just like we would in ac academics. Uh, and if you do it for one season, if you do football or if you do field hockey for the first time, and you never want to do it again, like, that's okay too. Uh, but trying things is it's high school experience. It's what we it's what we want you to do. We want you to say you've tried it and it wasn't for you, or you tried it and I love it. We have a student from Mexico trying hockey for the first time. <laughs> do you have, on that note, do you have separate freshman teams in some sports, all sports, no sports? How do you freshmen organize? Yeah, freshmen, I mean, freshmen could be on varsity. Mm -hmm. Right. It depends on skill level. Uh, so some of the sports or activities that come to mind are, you know, some of the more popular sports on campus as far as like soccer, a lot of kids play soccer, so we could have a freshman JV and varsity team. Um, I think in years past, like girls hockey has had a freshman uh, JV varsity. So a lot depends on demand, um, and we'll kind of evaluate that each season, athletic department or um, whatever department's running the extracurricular, we'll say, wow, we have you know, three, we can field three teams for cross country, so we're gonna do it. Um, another interesting situation is we had we had a Mean Girls production in the fall last year, 
and we had like a hundred kids sign up for it. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a whole different situation. Um, so it, it just it depends on student demand. Um, but if you have a ninth grader who is you know not ready for varsity and needs yeah. to be uh, on a freshman team. If you don't offer freshmen, we'll put them on JV, but take care of that student appropriately. We'll put them in a position where they're going to get hurt. Anyway. Again, uh, <laughs> 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 I 